Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all today. My name is Isha Ray. I'm professor of the Energy and Resources Group here, and I'm a member of the Weinstock Lectures Committee. Along with Grad Division, the Graduate Council, the Academic Senate, I'm most honored to welcome Bill McKibben, this year's speaker for the Barbara Weinstock Lectures on the Morals of Trade. We're very pleased to co-sponsor this lecture and discussion with the Energy and Resources Group, or ERG, the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management, or ESPM, both of the Rausa College of Natural Resources. We gratefully acknowledge the partnership of 350.org and Third Act, both co-founded by Mil McK Bill McKibben, of which more in a minute. The endowment supporting the Weinstock Lectures at UC Berkeley was given by Harris Weinstock in 1902 and named for his wife, Barbara, to support an annual lecture free and open to the public on the morals of trade. Former speakers include consumer advocate Ralph Nader, British MP Neil Kinnock, Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, former US Secretary of Labor Robert Reich, nutritionist and author Marion Nestle, and last year, Kevin Bales, scholar and activist on contemporary slavery. So Bill McKibben joins a distinguished and diverse group. Bill McKibben is the Schumann Distinguished Professor of Environmental Studies at Middlebury College in Vermont, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the author of over 20 books on global warming, the energy-driven economy, the meaning of home in rural America, including, of course, his 1989 classic, The End of Nature. He has been honored with degrees from numerous colleges and universities, the Gandhi Peace Prize, the Right Livelihood Award, sometimes called the Alternative Nobel, from the Swedish Parliament, and with his name given to a newly discovered species of gnat. I know, even I thought it was funny when I read about it, but then I thought, you know, what are people gonna do? We can only honor people in the currency of our realm. And for the biologists, naming someone, naming something new and undiscovered after someone unique is an honor, right? They can't help that it was a gnat. He co-founded 350.org, a grassroots campaign for climate action with chapters around the globe, and also Third Act, which brings together people above the age of 60 for action on climate change and climate justice. I've been thinking while preparing this introduction what it is that makes Bill McKibben's work truly extraordinary. And I think I want to highlight his ability to reach people and teach people from all walks of life and all along the life course, whether they be college students or codgers. Because McKibben's work shows his complete mastery over a deep truth that all good teachers know, people have to understand something before they believe it. And bringing that intuitive understanding of the climate crisis and what it means for us all to the many millions, bringing the understanding that climate change is about increasing heat and rising seas, yes, but also about the tenacity of money and power, coaxing into people the understanding that it's not enough to be an enviro who says no to damaging investments, but you must know when to say yes to infrastructures that you may not be sold on, but that are so, so much better than the status quo, and doing all of this in a way that is accessible and therefore believable is an extraordinary and rare skill. We are proud to have this skill amongst us today. So Professor McKibben, author, environmentalist, organizer, and educator extraordinaire, we welcome you most warmly to our beautiful city of Berkeley. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I want to begin with a couple of apologies. The first is, um, this is a very august lecture, and I'm, uh, I, I'm very honored to be giving it. In fact, 
not really the reason I agreed to come, because I usually say no to this kind of thing, was that I loved the title of it so much. You want me louder? You have to ask her. Can we turn it up at all? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not talking through. Well, here we go. How's that sound? Good. Um, the reason I came was because I liked the title of this lecture so much, the Weinstock Lecture on the Morals of Trade. I am, at some measure, a moralist, and so I could not resist. And I'm well aware that for such an august occasion, I should be wearing a necktie and a jacket, and I packed them with me, and I left my room to come over here, and it was simply too hot. And I, I thought for a minute that's just because I'm a wimpy Vermonter who lives up in the spine of the Green Mountains and I'm not used to it. But I looked on my phone and Palm Springs in California today set the record for the hottest October temperature ever measured in North America. Um, so this, I, I felt better and worse after that uh, uh, news. Um, this is a historic day that we share. Um, the second apology, the wonderful Jane Fink who organized all of this uh, asked me yesterday where my PowerPoint was and I was, um, I was chagrined to tell her that I, I didn't have one. Um, that I'm, well, I, 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 but I'll put it a different way. Since we're near Silicon Valley, um, I'm testing out a sort of new technology that I, I call virtual PowerPoint. And, and if it works as intended, the pictures should appear in your head as I speak. Uh, so let me know if they do. Um, and, and if they do, then we'll sell it to Mark Zuckerberg for a large sum of money. You won't even need a pair of goggles to make it work. It's especially nice for me to be here as a kind of intellectual break. This is the only uh, day or two that I'm spending this fall not out in the purple states. I came here from Michigan and Montana and I'm on to Pennsylvania and Nevada and Arizona and Georgia and everywhere else in the next little while. And um, I'm doing it with my colleagues from Third Act, a couple of whom I think are here, Deborah Moore and many of our volunteers from the wonderful chapter around here were tabling out in the uh, hall there. This is this new organization of people over the age of 60 that we've put together in the last couple of years. We now have about 100,000 members. Uh, they're doing incredible work, writing several hundred thousand postcards a month into the swing states. Uh, and jumping on buses to go to places like Nevada to knock on doors because it turns out that um, even Americans will still answer the door if there's a 75-year-old lady on the other side. So um, um, uh, on the off chance that any of you fall into this demographic, I hope that you will find the people out there and join in. Uh, uh, they and the crew from 350.org are doing spectacular work, and I'm grateful for it. Um, I've thought long and hard about this talk today and taken very seriously the charge to think about the morals of trade. And I'm going to make an argument for you today, and it's a big argument. Um, I think that it's time for us to end the trade in oil and gas around this world, but particularly and first in this country. And that is a large, uh, uh, would be a large change if it happened because oil and gas are the largest exports out of this country in dollar value. Um, I'm aware therefore that this is a big case to be making and I will do my best to make it with some precision. Um, I'm going to begin by outlining what strike me as three constraints on our action, followed by one large opportunity. And this will take a little while, so bear with me, but the constraints are the heart of the question that we face. 
the reason why we can no longer continue to do as we're currently doing. In order to propose a change that large, the end of export to our uh, most valuable commodities, it does strike me that one's required to produce um, exceptional set of arguments and evidence. So the first constraint is simply that the climate crisis we now face is exceptionally severe. Uh, it's the biggest problem that humans have ever faced, which is, again, a large claim. Let me talk about the last couple of years. I've obviously been tracking this for a long time since I wrote the first book about what we now call the climate crisis, what we then called the greenhouse effect back in 1989 when I was in my 20s. Um, the temperature has been rising steadily and dangerously since then. But beginning last year, it took a very sudden and steep spike upwards. Beginning in about January of 2023, I started getting calls from oceanographer friends around the world who were encouraging me in the strongest terms to go look at the emerging data sets about what was happening to the temperature of the oceans. It seemed to be going up very dramatically. And by May of 2023, we were recording the hottest ocean temperatures that we've ever recorded on this planet. Uh, in May of 2023, buoys off the Florida Keys found sea temperatures day after day after day in excess of 101 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the temperature to which, about to which you put a hot tub. Okay? Um, that heat soon moved onshore. We are able to take a daily measure of the temperature of the planet. We can average the temperature because there are enough thermometers and satellites and buoys to give us a good reading. And we know, therefore, what the average temperature on Earth is every day. That temperature always peaks around the solstice in the northern hemisphere. The few weeks around the solstice are the hottest averaged because the northern hemisphere has more land area than the southern, and so it holds more heat. And in those days around the solstice in 2023, the scientists told us that these were the hottest temperatures, the hottest days we'd ever recorded on planet Earth. Now, of course, those records go back at best about 200 years, because that's how long we have thermometers for. But scientists are quite good at extending that record through a series of proxies, uh, glacial sediments, uh, cores, uh, that tree rings, on and on and on. And so they were saying with confidence in June of last year that we were seeing the highest temperatures we've recorded on this planet in at least 125,000 years. Um, 125,000 years ago, the anthropologists tell us, was about the moment when humans started etching symbols on bone. Okay? So we're really back to the very dawn of anything that we would even begin to regard as uh, human prehistory. Uh, nobody that we'd really recognize, no societies that we would recognize, have lived on a hotter planet than we currently inhabit. And since June of last year, every month has broken the record for the hottest July, August, September, February that there's been. We set new all-time temperature records around the solstice this summer, uh, uh, breaking the ones set in 2023. The results of that, and again, remember, I'm just outlining the first constraint on our action. The results of that heating have been uh, precisely as scientists predicted, um, um, uh, terrible. Um, we're seeing the rapid melt of the ice caps at both the top and the bottom of the planet. Uh, the data in the last few weeks about the rate at which the great glaciers of the Antarctic are being undercut by warm water in the Southern Ocean is quite terrifying. As are the most recent studies, some of them just a few months old, about what's happening with the great ocean currents in the Atlantic, uh, which are beginning to flicker and to falter as uh, fresh water pours off a melting Greenland uh, into the North Atlantic. Um, 
in the last few weeks, we have new studies about what's going on in the Amazon, um, where uh, a mega drought is causing fire in the Amazon, not just in the usual places where people are trying to burn down the forest to prospect or, or, or graze cattle, but in the pristine interiors of the Amazon because the drought has gotten deep enough and the temperature high enough that the rainforest is just literally catching on fire. We seem to be very near some of uh, the tipping point that people have long warned about in the Amazon when that magnificent water transport system that the rainforest represents begins to break down. There are, the reason I'm saying these things is there's only so many really large physical features on planet Earth, the North Pole, the South Pole, the Amazon rainforest, the great ocean currents. Really every one of them is in now violent and chaotic flux. Um, on land, where we notice this most, I think, uh, is in hydrology, in the way that uh, water, huh, the way that water moves around this planet. Um, if you wanted one fact to understand the century in which we live, you could do a lot worse than warm air holds more water vapor than cold. Uh, Californians are particularly used to the first part of this, uh, that in arid areas you get more evaporation and drought, and then as night follows day, when it's hot, you get fire. And this is the reason that, above all, that California is now uh, lives in a fire season year-round. The reason that California, which when I was growing up, um, all the country, indeed most of the world, considered the kind of idol, uh, um, the most uh, beautiful and charmed place on planet Earth, is now a place where I think people live uh, during much of the year with a kind of eye cocked over the shoulder to see uh, what's happening at any given moment. I remember reading a couple of years ago an editorial in the Chronicle saying that large parts of California were now or might soon be uninhabitable for humans under current conditions because the fire danger had grown too high. Last year in Canada, the fires in the northern forest, uh, completely unprecedented, turned that country of 30 million into the fifth biggest carbon emitter on planet Earth, right next to China, India, uh, the US, uh, because so much carbon was pouring out of those conflagrations. Once that water is up in the atmosphere, it comes down. Increasingly, it comes down in deluge and flood. Um, where I live in Vermont, that's been a large problem um, because we're a uh, a country of steep hillsides and narrow valley floors, and we've had the two worst floods in our history in, in the last couple of years. Obviously, this week, we all have in our hearts the people of uh, Appalachia uh, who are dealing with exactly the same thing. Um, as that storm roared inland, inland with lots and lots and lots of um, water picked up from a record heat of the uh, waters of the Gulf of Mexico. The Doppler radar indicates that it dropped as much as four feet of rain on top of the mountains on the Blue Ridge just north of Asheville. Uh, we don't know the full extent of the damage yet, and we won't for a while, but clearly towns are gone. Um, um, places where people had lived for many generations essentially no longer exist. If you think this is bad in this country, and it is, it is far worse in other parts of the world that lack any of the resilience that money provides to um, um, bail them out. I mean, this week, while this is going on in Appalachia, without anyone paying attention, at least 148 people are dead in Nepal in some of the truly remarkable flooding we've ever seen. Uh, last year, the Pretty much the week after our flooding ended, our record rainfalls ended in Vermont, and because I was particularly sensitive to flooding for a little while, um, I was paying attention when they had the biggest rainstorms they've ever recorded in the north of Africa. Uh, uh, 
the rain in Libya was enough to wash out two dams, and then that river tore into a coastal city where it swept 10,000 people out to sea where they drowned in an hour. Um, that is uh, not only hideous, it's also hideously unfair. It's a good place to just remind ourselves of the ethical uh, uh, implications here. The entire continent of Africa, largest of our continents, has put just 3% of all the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Essentially, it's a rounding error in the calculations. The 3% of human beings who call themselves Americans have put 25% of all the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. No one, not China, will ever catch us in the historical record. And it's all still up there. The stuff that came out of the tailpipe of my family's Plymouth Fury in the 1970s when I was getting my learner's permit in the suburbs of Boston is still up there in the atmosphere trapping heat. Um, this is scary news, but the scarier news is that we're still nearer the beginning than the end of this process. Everything that I've described so far has happened with a little bit less than 1.5 degrees Celsius of extra heat trapped near the planet. But we're on a path to raise the temperature in the lives of the younger people in this room, really by the time they reach my age, uh, raise that temperature about three degrees Celsius unless we dramatically get off this path and very soon. Um, three degrees Celsius, were we to do that, uh, is probably enough to make sure that we won't have civilizations like the ones we're used to. The level of chaos that it produces, let's lay aside for the minute pretty basic questions like agriculture and water supply. Just concentrate on one thing. The UN estimates that that would be enough to produce between one and three billion climate refugees. That is to say, something like one person in four on this planet having to get up and leave their home. A million climate refugees, or a million refugees on our southern border, and a million refugees coming into Europe after the Syrian civil war were enough to totally discombobulate the politics of both, both areas with the ugly results that we're currently watching in our current presidential election. Multiply that by 1,000 or 3,000 and try to imagine what kind of world we live on then. Um, so that is the constraint, the first constraint under which we labor. Uh, we face by far the most dangerous situation that humans have ever faced and by orders of magnitude. Um, the second constraint is that we have very little time in which to solve it. Ah, we're used, and this is a hard thing for us to overcome, we are used to thinking of political problems as lasting forever. Um, that we just argue them over and over again and make incremental progress back and forth and that's just how it works. As long as I've been alive, we've been arguing about national health insurance in this country. I think it's a sin that we don't have it and that people die and go bankrupt each year as a result. I assume, maybe this is because I'm a, I come from the land of Bernie Sanders, that someday America will join the rest of the industrialized world and have it, and that'll be a good day. And it won't be harder once we actually decide to do it because we delayed. Climate change isn't like that. Past certain tipping points, there is no going back. Nobody has a scheme for how you freeze the Arctic back up again once you've melted it, okay? Um, so that constraint of time, that limit, makes this very different from other issues that we're used to dealing with. The best estimate that we have of this time frame comes from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the world's climate scientists, who in a 2021 paper evaluating the Paris Climate Accords, uh, concluded that if we had any hope of staying on that pathway that we set in Paris just eight years ago, that we would need 
to reduce emissions in half on this planet by 2030. Okay? 2030 by my watch is five years and four months away. It helps, among other things, to explain why this seems like a consequential presidential election to me. Um, 25 years, four months does not give us much time to make change on that scale. That's the constraint of time that we face. And the third constraint that we face is that we understand very clearly the uh, overwhelmingly dominant cause of the crisis that we face. And that cause is the combustion of coal and gas and oil. It accounts for well more than 80% of the emissions that we find in the atmosphere. Um, that is obviously a deeply ingrained habit in our economy. In fact, Darwin once said that language and fire were the two things that set human beings apart. Our habit of burning things stretches back at least 700,000 years. That's how long ago the archaeologists find the earliest campfire rings that they can carbon date. And really, that's how they tell there were humans around, are those fire rings. Um, burning stuff has been a useful thing for our species. We learned to cook food. That gave us the big brain. We were able to move north and south from the equator. The anthropologists even believe that many of the social bonds that mark our species probably come from those millennia of standing around the campfire at night. Think of it as a, a kind of proto-Zoom, you know, um, <laughs> that, that marked our species. And when we learn to control the combustion of coal and gas and oil in what we call the Industrial Revolution, that produced modernity. It produced everything that we know around us. So combustion has been an absolute hallmark, maybe the absolute hallmark of our species. But combustion is now causing us way more trouble than we could ever have imagined. Not just, though it would certainly be sufficient, the destruction of the planet's climate system and with it all the other physical systems on the surface of this planet. But even as that happens, nine million people a year die on this planet. That's about one death in five from breathing the combustion byproducts of fossil fuel. Um, if you've been to Delhi or Shanghai in recent years, this won't surprise you, but it happens here too. There are hundreds of thousands of cases of childhood asthma and many deaths in America every year due to breathing those particulates that happen inevitably as you burn fossil fuel. And we know who gets to live next to the refinery and next to the highway. It's the other reason that this is the paramount justice issue of our time. Um, And there is, in practical terms, no way to continue combustion uh, without causing the climate crisis that I've been describing. So far, the attempts to do uh, carbon capture at fossil fuel plants have been ludicrously expensive and completely ineffective. They do not represent a serious attempt to do anything other than separate the taxpayer from their money in an effort to allow the oil industry and the gas and coal industry to pretend that they are doing something about the climate crisis. So those are three constraints that, to me, govern our discussion about whether we should continue the trade in oil and gas. The tr oil and gas are causing the greatest problem that we've ever faced, and we have a very short period of time to solve it, requiring, I think, that we take severe and emergency measures in order to deal with it. So those constraints are crucial, but without the opportunity that I'm going to describe, 
they probably wouldn't be enough to get us to take action. Um, because uh, this has always been the problem, fossil fuel has been absolutely essential to the conduct of the world as we know it. And human beings have been unwilling to alter in any fundamental way their conduct on this planet. And it seems to me highly unlikely that in the next five years, human beings en masse will decide to change their lifestyles in ways that dramatically shift the amount of energy that we use. Many thanks to those of you who do this, and I do as much of it as I can myself. I would not count on it being uh, a solution to the problem that we face in the time that we have. But the opportunity and the very good news is that there is another possible exit from this dilemma. And it's been provided to us over the last few years by the hard work of engineers around this world, many of them here in the Golden State. And that is the very, 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 very rapid decline in the price of renewable energy. The price of energy from the sun and from the wind and the batteries to store that energy when the sun goes down or the wind drops have all fallen on the order of 90% over the last decade. Sometime three or four years ago, that fall took them past an invisible line where they became cheaper to than coal and gas and oil uh, to produce energy. And here, mind you, I'm not assigning coal and gas and oil the costs of the destruction of the planet. If we were doing honest accounting, uh, sun and wind would have been cheaper decades ago, almost from the moment they were born, okay? Um, surely on price, we now live on a planet where the cheapest way to produce power is to point a sheet of glass at the sun. That is a truly important moment in human history. I'm occasionally a Methodist Sunday school teacher, so I would say that represents a kind of water into wine miracle. The cheapest way to make energy on this planet is to point a sheet of glass at the sun. The second cheapest is to take advantage of the fact that the sun differentially heats the earth, producing the winds that turn those turbines, both onshore and off. Um, what that means is, there is no technical or financial obstacle to very quickly weaning ourselves off of fossil fuel. Um, and indeed, in the few places that have made a significant effort, we begin to see enormous progress. And the chief among those is right now California. And I don't think even Californians truly uh, appreciate exactly what's happening in this state this year. The effort over the last four or five years to build lots of solar capacity and to put lots of batteries on the grid has in 2024 finally reached some kind of tipping point. For the last 100 days, almost every day, California has produced more than 100% of the electricity it produces for long stretches of the day from renewable energy. At night, when the grid goes, when the sun goes down, the biggest source of supply to the grid is often now batteries. Uh, batteries that did not exist on that grid three years ago, okay? Here's the bottom line from that. California, and these numbers I just were reporting out for the New Yorker from my friend Mark Jacobson at Stanford, who's the, really the, the authority on all of this. California this year has used 29% less natural gas to generate electricity than it did last year. That's the most impressive number like that we've had around the world to date, I think. This, after all, is the fifth largest economy in the world and arguably the most modern, and it's using a third less fossil fuel to produce electricity this year than last. That is a big enough number 
to start taking a bite out of that three degrees Celsius if we were able to quickly apply it elsewhere. And there are a few places elsewhere it's showing up. Texas is now outdoing California. And in fact, uh, having praised California, let me hasten to add that your governor is now starting to screw up in a large way, I think. Um, um, a series of decisions that make it harder to do distributed energy on rooftops is a serious mistake. And yesterday's decision not to allow schools to generate their own power with solar on the roof is kind of a travesty. Uh, so do your best to keep, get California back on the path that it was on because there's still a lot of work to do. But this example shows up other places this year too, and some of them much more surprising. Let me tell you a little story that I wrote about last week. I do a, a, a free newsletter every week, which if you're a glutton for punishment, you're welcome to track down on the web and see. Um, um, beginning of this year, the country of Pakistan, which by the way, has suffered more climate damage than any country on earth, uh, I think it's fair to say at this point. The two most epic floods since Noah in the last decade. Uh, tens of millions of people displaced, uh, millions of homes destroyed. Uh, uh, I mean, imagine what's happening in Appalachia right now, but with the water covering a third of the country. That's what happened in Pakistan. At any rate, Pakistan earlier this year, people began to note that demand on the national electric grid was down about 10%, which does not happen in this world. Demand for electricity goes up, not down, unless there's a very steep recession or something like COVID, okay? And Pakistan was not in a recession, and so people couldn't figure out what was going on. With the help of Google Earth over the last few months, people have figured it out, because if you go look at the images from Lahore or Karachi or Islamabad, you see a dramatic increase in the number of solar panels on roofs. Not official, officially recognized solar projects that were registered with the government or anything like that. No, this was just that Chinese solar panels are now so cheap that people were just buying them and putting them on the top of their store, their mall, their factory, their home. Pakistanis apparently have put up the equivalent in the last six months of 30% of their national electric grid in solar panels. That's an extraordinary feat. And it's apparently being echoed across large parts of Africa. We're seeing the same kind of data from Lesotho, from South Africa, from Mozambique, from Madagascar, and there are hints of it further north in Africa too. Um, those are remarkable changes. And the point of it is to say, and the opportunity is to say, that shutting down the export of oil and gas as quickly as we possibly could over the next few years, and ending the combustion of oil and gas everywhere, including here, as quickly as we possibly could over the next few years, is not some pie in the sky impossibility, some utopian ideal, it is entirely possible to do. Understanding that opportunity is important because I do not think we have fully taken it in yet. Even those of us who really care about this stuff, we still refer to sun and wind as alternative energy, as if it was the kind of whole foods of energy, you know? <laughs> It is the Costco of energy, all right? It is the cheap stuff available in bulk, ready to go. And if we can get that through our heads, then much could possibly change. And if much changed, since we're talking here about world trade, there would be extraordinary benefits in most places. 80% of human beings live in countries that are net importers of fossil fuel. In most of those countries, uh, that import of fossil fuel is by far the biggest obstacle to a favorable balance of trade. It's the reason 
that country after country is now facing a balance of payments deficit, uh, uh, often a crisis, uh, as they struggle to continue to keep their countries operating. Um, it would be a gift of historic proportion to remove that burden from those places, especially since though solar energy works beautifully everywhere, it works best near the equator. Uh, this would be an inversion of the historical uh, 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 experience on this planet where the global south would enjoy a comparative advantage in the world ahead. It would not be easy to do. It requires coming up with lots of capital in order to build those panels and wind turbines. Uh, when you burn fossil fuel, what you pay for is the fuel, and you pay for it every month, month after month. When you rely on renewable energy, what you burn is capital, because you have to get some to put it up in the first place. But the advantage is enormous. The, major, the one really major study that I know about this came two years ago from Oxford, a team at Oxford, and they calculated that the rapid conversion to renewable energy would save the Earth tens of trillions of dollars over the next few decades, again, not taking into account in any way the slowdown in the highly expensive destruction of the planet that we currently enjoy, counting only the sheer cost of having to pay for fossil fuel. The sun is happy to deliver energy for free every day when it rises above the horizon. If we can get through the one-time technological hurdle of building out this stuff, then we are sitting pretty. I do not mean to imply that it comes without any cost, because it does. You have to, among other things, and go out and mine some stuff in order to make it happen. And we need to do that mining of lithium and cobalt and everything else as responsibly and humanely as we can, and we should be capable of doing that, uh, uh, as, and it's up to us to try and make that happen. But the volume of that mining would be a shadow of what we do at the moment. Um, there was a study last week from Rocky Mountain Institute that indicated that the total mining materials cost for batteries between now and 2050, the, the volume of minerals you would need to mine would be less than the amount of coal we mined last year. All right? And if you think about it for a minute, it becomes very clear why that is. If you mine some lithium, you put it in a battery, and there it happily sits for the next 25 years doing its job. And if you need to, you then send it off to the new fact, a new plant on the California-Nevada border where they pour it into a low temperature kiln and recover 98% of the lithium and the cobalt and the copper and whatever else. This should be fairly quickly a kind of steady state circular economy if we could get it going. Um, um, and that, as I say, would be a beautiful thing to have happen. So, I've outlined for you the most devilish problem that we've ever faced, and I've outlined a plausible solution to it that we can begin to see taking shape, but that, again, has to take shape with incredible speed to have any chance of doing the thing we needed to do. Uh, we're definitely going to run the planet on sun and wind in 30 years, but if it takes us 30 years to get there, it will be a broken planet that we run on sun and wind. So the speed is the paramount part. The question that naturally arises then is why are we not making this transition as fast as possible? And the answer, of course, because you are uh, all cognizant of how politics works in this country and in this world, is that there are some people who want us not to make this transition. And those are the people who own the reserves of coal and gas and oil that would become essentially valueless in that scheme. And those numbers are large. 
it obviously fluctuates with the daily price of gas and oil, but at the moment, just in this country, there are several tens of trillions of dollars worth of fossil fuel reserves. Um, that's several tens of trillions of reasons for a very small number of people to fight to keep us from making this change, and fight they are. Um, I don't want to review this history at length because I'm in danger of going on too long here, but let me say only that the fossil fuel industry has been a bad actor uh, and an intellectually dishonest one from the beginning. Um, uh, when I was writing that book in the 1980s, we now know from whistleblowers and archives that the fossil fuel industry was studying climate change at least as diligently as I was. Exxon was the biggest company in the world. They had a huge staff of scientists. Their product was carbon. Of course they were going to understand it, and they did. And we found the documents that the scientists gave their executives that predicted with stunning accuracy what the temperature would be in 2020. They were spot on. And they were believed. Uh, executives at places like Exxon began building their drilling rigs higher in the 1980s in order to compensate for the rise in sea level that they knew was in the offing. Uh, they started mapping out precisely which portions of the Arctic they wanted to lease once they'd melted it. They didn't tell the rest of us, though. They spent, across the industry, tens of billions of dollars building this architecture of deceit and denial and disinformation that kept us locked for 30 years in a completely sterile debate about whether or not global warming was real or not. A debate, remember, that both sides knew the answer to at the beginning. It's just one of them was willing to lie, and it became the most consequential lie in human history because it cost us the thing we needed most dearly, which was time. That's why we have five years and four months to solve this, not 35 years to solve this, okay? And why we may not be able to solve it. Um, so, so, and let me just add, I, you know, I helped launch this fossil fuel divestment campaign that's become the largest anti-corporate campaign of its kind in history with about $40 trillion in endowments and portfolios that have divested from fossil fuel. One of the huge victories was the University of California system, and many thanks to everybody who helped with that. Um, one of the arguments I made then and throughout, not the most important argument, but one that I think bears repeating here since we're in the halls of a university, is that their consummate intellectual dishonesty disqualified them from uh, sh should have no uh, place in any uh, university system. These are theoretically places where we still take uh, intellectual honesty with some seriousness, and their, uh, their conduct is the kind that would get any student expelled or any teacher fired, and correctly so. Um, sorry about that rant. I just got going. Um, this brings us back to this question of trade, since that's what this Weinstock lecture is about. And to my argument that one component of phasing out the use of these uh, uh, commodities, coal, gas, and oil, is to end their export to the rest of the world immediately. Which sounds like a very, very extreme position to take, but in fact has plenty of precedent in American history. Those of you of a certain age uh, will recall the uh, oil crisis of the 1970s, when the problem was not that we were melting the poles, it was not that we were destroying large swaths of Appalachia. The problem was, and it was a real problem, that we had to wait in long lines to get gasoline for our cars. That emergency was enough to persuade our Congress and our administration to ban the export of oil abroad beginning in 1973. And that ban lasted until 2015, when in one of the great ironies of American history, uh, the fossil fuel industry used the moment when all the world's environmentalists were gathered in Paris for the final negotiations of the Paris Climate Treaty uh, to quickly 
pass through Congress an end to that oil and gas export ban. Okay, um, I almost no one paid attention to it because, as I say, every environmentalist was busy in Paris trying to wrap up that deal. I well remember sitting in a little cafe, uh, someplace in the Latin Quarter typing out on my laptop what may have been the only op-ed opposing the end to this uh, uh, oil ban, uh, you know, in between sessions. Of the, and we published it, and, and, but it was, as has been the case once or twice with other op-eds I've written, insufficient to the day. Um, and the oil industry carried its way. So we resumed export of these commodities only in 2016. But in the time that passed, we have turned this into an enormous, enormous industry. America is now the leading exporter of natural gas on the entire planet, more than Qatar, more than the Saudis, more than Iran, more than anybody, okay? Um, it exploded, uh, uh, and the size of that um, export is extraordinary. I'm going to focus my remarks here when I talk about this question on liquefied natural gas from the Gulf of Mexico because that's the actual contentious heart of this debate at the moment, by far the biggest part of it. But the same goes, I think, for export of oil or gas from anywhere in this country. Um, in the last 10 years, that trade has exploded, and that has been very bad news First, for local communities on the ground, almost all of them communities of color and poor communities who have the misfortune to live next to these truly enormous and truly disgusting facilities that have been built. Uh, uh, one of the most famous CP1 in the Louisiana parishes uh, has been an almost constant violation of its, uh, even its modest agreements with the government of Louisiana about things like flaring and emitting uh, for the last months. Um, it's literally hellish to live next to these places. I, earlier last year, interviewed a guy um, who had been born in uh, 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 Isle of Saint, Saint John de Charles in Louisiana, which was the first place, uh, he was a tribal member, it was the first place in this country that the federal government evacuated because of rising sea levels. Uh, he relocated upstream uh, to Cameron Parish, where within a year or two, they built this giant LNG terminal directly next to his house, and the company relocated him yet again further upstream. Um, um, that's the kind of thing that we're now beginning to see in the kind of closing days of the climate crisis. Um, that export of LNG is a real problem also for Americans who remain connected to the gas grid and who can't afford to pay the elevated prices that come when you're exporting this commodity abroad, which is one of the reasons why there's been substantial opposition to that export from those parts of the country, particularly the Northeast, that are still heavily dependent on uh, natural gas. But most of all, of course, the problem that this LNG export prevents, uh, presents is to the global environment, to the climate crisis. And this takes a little bit of explaining here, a little bit of physics. For a long time, people assumed that the export of gas was actually an environmental good all things considered. And the reason was that we hoped and thought that it might be substituting for coal in other places, as indeed it has to some extent in this country, uh, that we were substituting coal for gas, and that that was better. And the reason we thought it was better was because when you burn gas uh, in a power plant, you produce about half as much carbon dioxide per BTU as you do when you burn coal. All right. So it felt like that was a good thing. In fact, when America boasts about its decline in carbon emissions over the last 20 years, it's almost entirely the result of this substitution of natural gas for coal. 
which is why you should ask a deeper question, not what's happening to our carbon emissions, but what's happening to our greenhouse gas emissions. Because about 15 years ago, a small group of scientists began to suspect that there was a real problem here. And the real problem is called methane. Um, um, though natural gas, which is mostly methane, is cleaner when you burn it, if it, if it is uh, released unburnt to the atmosphere, it's much, much more effective at trapping heat than CO2. Molecule for molecule, depending on how you do the time analysis, something like 80, 80 times more effective at trapping heat, which means all of you who can do the math that as little as 2% or so leak rate is enough to make this worse than coal. All right. Now, the fossil fuel industry did not like this research as it began to emerge. I started writing about it, some of the first articles about it in the New York Review of Books uh, almost 15 years ago. And the most important player was a methane scientist at Cornell University named Robert Howarth. Uh, and they ridiculed him uh, in ways that I've rarely seen any scientist attacked, uh, uh, the industry and its defenders in Washington, many of whom liked natural gas and the export of it because they saw it as a strategic advantage in many ways to the US, a way to gain uh, both balance of payments money and strategic power in the rest of the world. But study after study, now hundreds of them over the intervening decade, has found, unfortunately, that Howarth was right and that huge amounts of methane were leaking in every part of this process. That we were, when we flew satellite drones and drones over fracking fields, we were finding leak rates of seven or eight uh, percent. That there were enormous leakages at every step of the operation, particularly when we took this stuff uh, super chilled it, compressed it, put it on boats, sailed it across the ocean to Asia, uh, and, and took it back out again and pumped it through pipelines. Uh, the leakage rates made it clear in Howarth's uh, writing and now many others, and the most recent paper was just released a couple of days ago, that the export of natural gas was producing more greenhouse gas emissions than the export of coal was that in essence, America had over a decade built up uh, a, a, a huge coal-like export fleet. And the numbers are astonishing because of the scale of this. If the industry built out all the LNG export terminals that they have applied to build out, then within a very few years, American LNG exports, and these numbers come from an energy analyst named Jeremy Simons, then American LNG exports would be producing more greenhouse gases than everything that happens in the European Union. Every car and home and factory from Athens to Helsinki would be doing less climate damage than LNG exports from the Gulf of Mexico in the US. Okay. That's why Last year, a bunch of us with uh, local environmental justice groups and Third Act kind of in the lead, led this campaign to get the Department of Energy to put a pause on the permitting of new LNG export facilities. Not to stop the export, that was too much to you know, have any hope of winning in the short term, merely to pause the granting of permits for new terminals, we were already, remember, the largest exporter in the world. That became a very difficult fight in and of itself, um, but we were able to win it uh, in January of this year when the Department of Energy announced that they would be doing an extensive review to take this newest science from people like Howarth and the newest economics about the cost to Americans into account. That was a huge victory, perhaps the biggest single defeat that the oil industry has ever suffered in this country. They did not react well. Uh, 
This is, many of you may recall that story in the Washington Post a few months ago when Donald Trump was meeting with oil executives and telling them that if they could cough up a billion dollars for his campaign, they would, he would do anything they wanted. Well, it was clear from the notes of that meeting that the thing they wanted by far above all was an end to this ban on LNG, on new approvals for LNG export terminals. Even if Trump's not elected, there's a very good chance that Joe Manchin, on his way out of the Senate in the lame duck Congress, will try to make this happen. He's introduced a bill to do so. And it has the support of a fair number of Democrats, including people like Martin Heinrich from New Mexico, because New Mexico produces a huge percentage of its revenues for running the state from the sale of gas. So this is very likely it's going to be a very hard fight to keep this from resuming. The industry used the invasion of Ukraine to justify this uh, big increase in exports. But in fact, that's, if it was ever valid, is certainly valid no longer. Europe is awash in natural gas, and every single uh, uh, analyst says that demand in Europe is now shrinking dramatically because, like California, uh, for its own reasons, uh, Europe used the invasion of Ukraine to go on the renewable energy course in a serious way. Yesterday, Britain shut down the last operating coal-fired power plant in the country that coal built. Uh, the Germans the Germans passed the 50% mark in the production of uh, uh, renewable energy uh, earlier this year. This is gas destined for Asia, and it's very much equivalent to what the tobacco industry did after America got serious about trying to prevent the sale of cigarettes here. What they did was, uh, uh, well, what they did was go try to sell cigarettes to people in China. Um, and that's exactly what's happening here. A last ditch effort to lock in Asian economies, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, to using American natural gas if they can get them to build the power plants and the uh, uh, import terminals and things, then they've got them hooked for another 30 or 40 years. And of course, that's a problem for those places, but it's a problem for everyone. The secondhand smoke that comes from burning natural gas uh, is mixes into the global atmosphere in a matter of four or five days and raises the temperature everywhere around the planet. One of the things you should be concluding here is that natural gas is a dangerous thing, um, which is why you're very lucky to have this Proposition GG on the Berkeley ballot this year that would make it easy uh, to uh, rid at least this um, virtuous Berg from uh, its addiction to this particular fuel, but we need to do it everywhere around the world and we need to do it fast. So, the, both the moral, since that's the title of this lecture, and the practical seem to me to point us in the same direction towards the obvious conclusion that it would be a highly sensible policy to, as soon as possible, in the course of the next few years, cease the exportation of gas and oil around the world and to leave that gas and oil in the ground where it safely can be stored away without doing damage, to replace it with the energy that comes to us from the sun, to replace, as it were, energy from hell with energy from heaven, all right? Um, and if we did that, it would obviously have enormous impact on trade. And I'll just end by saying, we've always assumed that more trade is good. I, I think that's been the sort of basic bottom line. But I think that that's, at this point in human history, not clear at all. And I want to leave you with one vision in your head related to trade. Currently, about 40% of all the ship traffic on planet Earth is just 
carrying coal and oil and gas back and forth across the oceans to be burnt. That is not necessary. The sun rises in the east every morning and sets in the west every evening, having taken a transit across the planet, delivering energy gracefully and benignly. We do not need that great sh fleet of ships sailing, and to dock them would be a hardship in certain ways to a small number of people, but an extraordinary gift to the planet at large and especially to its future. So there I end. Thank you very much. Don't, don't, um, don't exert yourselves. I don't know about you, but it is, I'm finding it very hot in here. And if there's anybody who's just feeling, I mean, you, nobody should you feel free to go and get outside. And especially if anybody's feeling uh, just a little bit kind of uh, off or faint, don't hesitate because it is very hot. This is a hot day. I'm grateful to the University Arrangements Committee for, um, you know, making the temperature reflect my message so accurately, but it, it, we may have done overdone it just a little bit. How shall we handle questions here? So I'd like to make a comment about the Q&A. We have two Q&A mics on either side of the room. You can form a line of about five or six people behind the Q&A mics. Please do not make speeches during the Q&A. Please stick to questions and keep it brief. Thank you so much. Yes, I, I, I've set a bad example by making a long, rambling speech, but what can I tell you? I wouldn't say that. You are the invited speaker. So well, you should you. be speaking. Thank you, Bill, um, for coming here. So I'm here just and... going to monitor this a little bit to make sure everyone gets a chance. And, um, you know, like Jane said, just try to keep it as brief as possible. So, Because there are many people wanting to ask questions. So please. Sorry. Thank you, Bill, for, for coming here and helping us understand what's going on. Congratulations. The virtual PowerPoint worked. Okay, uh, the images are in our head. Um, very glad to hear it. So you mentioned this proposition at the city level. Yes, we sir. had a chance to meet a year ago to brainstorm putting climate on the ballot. And in half the states in America, the people can reclaim the laws and put laws on the ballot. So if you had a magic wand, time is of the essence. In 26 and 28, if you could put a climate solution on the ballot, uh, in almost half the states in America, what, what comes to mind? Well, I mean, so I want to put something on the ballot that has a chance of passing. Um, and in much of the country, being somewhat less enlightened than Berkeley, a good, useful place to start would be banning new gas hookups uh, uh, for any new construction. I know that you've tried that here and had the, you know, important luminaries like the California Restaurant Association do their best to overturn it. But that's an important step, too. But I'm very grateful for this GG proposition. It's very smart. There's building decarbonization underway in a few other places around the country. Local Law 97 in New York is trying to do the same thing on a very large scale. Um, this has to happen fast because, you know, given that we have five years, Mostly, we're talking about things that are already built. Uh, uh, the good news is that it's not that hard to do. There is a kind of trinity of appliances that makes this very easy. Uh, there's the heat pump to replace the fire in your basement. They work better and more cheaply. There is the EV or the e-bike to replace the fire under the hood of your car. These work better too. Uh, and there is in place of the campfire in your kitchen, uh, there is the magnetic induction cooktop. I'm the cook in my family. Mine costs $60 from Amazon. Uh, I've used it for years. Don't ask me how it works, magnets, but it works fine and with very little energy. So uh, this is not a, I mean, these are entirely doable things. And now there's money in the IRA to make each of these transitions more affordable for the people who need for them to happen. Hi, Bill. Um, just wanted to say it's an honor to uh, attend your lecture today. 
Um, so I just wanted to get your input on um, the role of the global south. I come from um, Malaysia, a very small country in Southeast Asia, and we kind of contribute about 0.1% to the global emissions every year. And um, I guess uh, our economy or economies in the global south alike are far less developed than um, countries in the global north, like America, and they contribute significantly more to um, global emissions. Um, and countries like Malaysia, they they rely a lot on, on oil and gas to kind of like run the economy and invest in things like renewable energy or like solar power in the first place. So I just want to get your input on like, um, how does the global north kind of like expect us to keep up with the pace of development of the world and also kind of um, re re rely on resort to like renewable energy instead of renew yeah, relying on oil and gas? Yeah. Sure. So in a just world, the last barrel of oil that we would pump would come from countries like Malaysia. Uh, and we'd phase it out in such a way that the poorest countries who've done the least to cause this problem uh, would get the privilege of you know, getting the, some of their oil out of the ground and getting to make some money from it. We don't live in a just world, and it's not going to happen in an orderly fashion like that. The last barrel of oil that gets pumped on planet Earth is going to come from Saudi Arabia because they can get it out of the ground for $3 a barrel. And so that's where it will come from. Um, that's not fair, but countries like Malaysia actually have an extraordinary opportunity at the moment. Malaysia and other Asian countries uh, are largely at roughly the place where China was 10 or 15 years ago on the energy curve, but they're coming into that point at a moment when renewable energy is the cheapest uh, possible alternative. And so I just looked at the data for India, for instance. Um, it's now cheaper to build a new solar farm in India than it is to buy the coal to operate an existing coal-fired power plant. Uh, the economics are actually good for doing renewable energy, and the economics, forget the forget the payments that come from oil and gas, the economics of a globally warmed world are absolutely ruinous for a place like Malaysia. Uh, you know, we're gonna have a hard time rebuilding um, Appalachia after this hurricane, but uh, the kind of crises that come uh, with a rapid warming planet are absolute death for countries that don't have that kind of uh, monetary buffer. Uh, in order to do it. In a just world, and this is one of the things we fight for through the global process, uh, the capital required to build the renewable energy systems would come from the global north. The US Congress isn't going to provide it. It's not politically possible, I don't think, anytime soon in this country. What may be possible and what people are working hard on is for things like the IMF, which is dominated by the US, to figure out how to use its resources to take enough risk out of the investment that pension funds, you know, in, in well, I mean, look, the, the, the retirement fund from the University of California system, my guess, is, has as much capital as there is free capital in all of Malaysia, you know, uh, uh, so that things like the University of California Pension Fund can invest responsibly in building uh, solar and wind across the global south. And if the IMF was doing that, at least we would start to have some of that transfer of capital north to south in productive ways. Hi, Bill. Uh, my name is Felipe. I just want to say first and foremost, uh, you know, excellent lecture. I appreciate you bringing awareness to these very important issues. Uh, that being said, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, that I was a bit surprised that you didn't bring up uh, nuclear at all. Because me personally, um, I'm a huge proponent of nuclear. I'm very interested in the prospect of scalable nuclear in energy being adopted worldwide. But the concerns I have uh, about potential, well, I have concerns about potential oppositions from nations vested in fossil fuels. Can these uh, risks be mitigated through peaceful diplomacy or will more assertive military, economic, or political measures be necessary? Thank you. You mean will nations have to militarily coerce the U.S. into giving up its fossil fuel export? Yeah, I, I don't think that's gonna happen. I don't think that's a, a likely path. 
But let's talk about nuclear for a minute because it's a very interesting question. Um, its usefulness obviously lies in the fact that it produces power without much carbon. Um, its danger lies, for my money, less in the things that we've talked about in the past. I'm willing to, I'm willing to believe that given several thousand years, we'll come up with ways to deal with nuclear waste, so on and so forth. Um, I don't think it presents a peril on the same scale as climate change. The main danger right now of nuclear power is that it wastes insane amounts of money. Um, it's super expensive and very difficult to make it work on a planet where we now produce solar energy at two cents a kilowatt hour. Um, that's, the, that's the problem that nuclear runs into. We've been hoping that small modular reactors, the SMRs, might change this equation. Uh, so far, they're not coming in with the cost results that we'd hoped. Maybe they will. Maybe fusion will. I, it doesn't, the fact that we put aside a few tens of billions of dollars in the IRA to keep researching this stuff doesn't bother me. And I hope the results change. But in the meantime, for those of you who really love nuclear power, take comfort in the fact that the largest nuclear reactor we know about hangs 93 million miles up in the sky. And so we are basically doing nuclear power every time we put up a solar panel or a wind turbine. So there you go. Thanks. Hi, um, I just first want to echo everyone's thanks for coming here and for delivering an amazing lecture. Um, I apologize, I'm not super well versed in the production and trade of solar panels and solar energy, but I was curious, you mentioned that um, Pakistan has just on the volition of their own citizens, it seems, switched over to solar energy um, by buying cheap solar panels from China. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if China like dominates this market of producing solar panels and if the US would be willing to strike up this big deal with China, um, especially considering that that would make them more of an importer and less of an exporter yes. if it was in expense of LNG. So this is a super interesting question on many levels. China is the big producer, the low cost producer of solar panels. Um, and there's some problems with that. Among other things, we think that at least some of it in the past has had to do with forced labor in parts of Xinjiang. We obviously should be doing everything we can to stop that, but that's not why they're low cost. It's because they've gotten good at doing this. Um, the US actually uh, puts a tariff on the import of Chinese solar panels to try and build a domestic solar panel industry. I, that would be smart, I guess. Um, under uh, sort of normal circumstances. I think that the time element that we're facing argues against it. I didn't, I haven't yet done the work to prepare. I was sort of thinking I might before this, but I was going on too long. I knew this was gonna go on too long anyway. The thing I'd like to actually research, and I wish some of the economists in the, um, in the audience would sort of think about for a minute. Uh, I, I think there's an argument you could make that given the emergency that we're in, a smart global policy right now would be to just have everybody chip in to run these solar panel factories in China 24 seven around the clock. They're right now not doing that because they're, the price has gotten so low that they can't make much money. But I, to, run those panel, to run those factories around the clock and then it would be interesting to have somebody model what would happen if you just dropped off huge piles of solar panels on every wharf and dock around the world and let people come and take them away. Um, this is somewhat akin to the, you know, when you, the, the, the economists who model what happens if in the course of a recession, you just drop money in bags from helicopters so that people can go spend it. Um, and often that actually turns out to be a kind of plausible solution. But in this case, uh, it strikes me as really interesting to model. I haven't thought through all the ramifications of it and what the blowback might be and things, but given the very few number of years we have to deal with this, it seems to me at, worst, at, worth, at, at least worth thinking about as a thought experiment. So thank you for bringing that up. Go ahead. Good evening, I'm gonna be using the captions on my phone and ask my questions. So, what do you think about local communities that have landfills closing due to space capacity? 
Do you think it's considered to think about the closure of landfills as a way to capture methane for energy production at the local level? Yeah, we do this in Vermont. We try to take energy out of landfills, and it's, uh, uh, it's useful. It doesn't scale to be an enormous part of the solution here, but it's certainly worth doing, I think. Again, okay. echoing whatever else is said, wonderful talk. Thank you for coming. I think my question is, you know, as I'm thinking about this idea of hitting things by 2030 and think about all the ways in which, you know, the world itself just continues to run on hydrocarbons, not just for energy, but in the sense of, you know, plastics, synthetic rubbers, chemical feedstocks, yep. things which, you know, at least from my, you know, less informed standpoint, seem harder to move off of. Yep. And do you have thoughts, you know, sure, you maybe ban plastic bags in one city, but... You know, there's so much around us that just yep. is built all around these. How do you see us moving away from those uh, as well? The question's about how do we move away from plastics and things as well. And it's an important question because the fossil fuel industry, as we begin to limit its access to, you know, power plants, is eager to use plastic as one of the, uh, you can, you basically plastic is you just take natural gas and turn it into a plastic bag. Um, and uh, uh, the good news is that we we obviously don't need plastic bags or many other plastics in quite the same way that we used to need hydrocarbons to run our energy economy. Things, they're, you know, they're, they're more substitutable. And the other good news is uh, uh, even in their current um, state, they represent about 3% of emissions. We think in the worst case, that'll go up to 5% or something by mid-century. So it's a real problem, one that we should be working hard on. I'm on the board of a group called Beyond Plastics that I highly recommend to you all. I think they're doing very good work. Um, I'm glad to see California doing its bag ban uh, uh, in recent weeks. We should continue this. Um, but the core question here in the next five years is about building renewable energy fast. That's the place where we have the alternatives ready to go, uh, completely affordable. After 2030, then we're, you know, and as we build out all that easy renewable energy, then there's a whole series of things that are a little harder to abate that we're working on hard, steel, aviation, on and on. But taken together, they don't represent anywhere near the bulk, the majority of the problem. The majority of the problem is power generation, uh, uh, vehicle travel, uh, and home consumption for things like heating and cooling. And those things we now are completely capable of dealing with right now without disruption in any serious way. Uh, thank you, Bill, for your talk today and for your lifetime of being a climate champion. Give me a minute, please. Just give... No, no, I can take a few more. Whatever you think, sir. I'm sorry. No. Okay, please continue. I just wanted okay. to check if the speaker was doing fine. just checking on my, my mental stamina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Bill. Um, my question is, it seems like um, um, many countries around the world are... Um, getting on board and on board at some level with renewable energy, but some large uh, countries are not. And uh, Russia comes to mind uh, from the, all the information we've been getting from uh, their invasion of Ukraine. And um, I guess my basic question is, can we do it without Russia? Can we do it without countries that, are, uh, that have that philosophy of production no matter what? Yeah. Well, you, I mean, look, Russia is a huge problem for a thousand reasons. Um, one of the nicest things about getting the rest of the world off fossil fuel is that it would rob Vladimir Putin of his piggy bank. He's the biggest oil baron in, the, in Europe, and he's used his winnings to launch a land war in Europe in the 21st century. Um, um, so that would be very nice. Russia's not a big enough economy that it will disrupt dramatically this transition. Their, their economy, I think, is smaller than Italy's at the moment. So it's, the good news is that China, which is the really important player, is making this transition very rapidly. They're building more than half of all the renewable energy on Earth. The real question is going to be what happens in India. India is at the inflection point sort of where China was 15 years ago, coming into its really high use of energy phase. But they're coming in at a point when if they want, they could use renewable energy as the predominant source of energy. 
It's not easy. Uh, Modi uh, campaigned for office flying on the corporate jet of the biggest coal company in India, uh, Adani. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I, you know, I, I was glad to see him get a bit of a bloody nose in the last election, and I think it bear, you know, bodes well maybe for some uh, ongoing change in India. But that's the country that really bears watching more than any. And directly behind them, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia. These are the huge population centers uh, uh, that whose you know, decisions will really define what happens with energy over the next 10 years. Yes, thank, thanks, Bill, for um, all your work. The way you gather the science is really important. I do, I do want to raise, I think that there's political naivete. And, and, and I want to pose that the, 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 you said tens of trillions invested. The way, the, the way capitalism works, that is, that is not something that just gets cast off. And, and there's a deeper problem, and it's a system. That, that's how I see it. And I, I wanted to pose how you see that question. I know you must have thought about it. And, and, and I mean, I feel we need a revolution. And that's fast when it happens. And, and that does answer one of the challenges you pose. Sure. I know you're not for revolution, but, mm. but, but I, well, OK, I'm, I'm willing to hear what you have to say about it. But, but anyway, so. That's my question. Sure. It's Thank a good you. question. And, and I, I mean, as I said in my talk, I think you're absolutely right. The reason this is so hard is those tens of trillions of dollars. That's a prize way worth fighting for. And uh, in our system, it's easy enough to game our political system that the fossil fuel industry has been successful in doing this. And that's why, A, we organize to stand up to them. And we've, that's what I've spent the last number of years doing and going to jail over and over again. And we've you know, beaten a lot of projects and uh, cost them $40 trillion in uh, investment capital and on and on, and weakened them considerably. And now they're being weakened very considerably by the advent of these new technologies, which we can boost and support. Um, I don't think that there's going to be a kind of uh, a political revolution in this country in the next few years, though who knows? I mean, we're obviously entering completely uncharted territory. I mean, one of our, the, who may be the leading candidate for president right now, yesterday proposed letting the police in America loose for one day to beat the hell out of everyone uh, to prevent crime. In a world like that, who knows what trigger, you know, what events will happen, I, I predict. But I do know that there is a powerful revolution underway with the substitution of locally produced energy. And it's a deep one. Um, think for a minute about who the biggest oil and gas baron in America is. It's the Koch brothers, one only one of whom is still alive. But uh, these guys own more refining and pipeline capacity than anybody else. And they used their money to completely degrade our political system over the course of decades. The reason that the Supreme Court is doing what it's doing is not really because of Donald Trump. It's because of an endless effort by the Koch brothers eventually successful. Um, so depriving them of their income would be a revolution of sorts. Uh, nothing, you know, none of this gets all the change we need uh, 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 in the time that we need. But all of it moves us, I think, quite substantially in a pretty subversive direction, the direction of uh, undermining the biggest oligarchs on this planet. Remember, if you depend on a commodity that's only available in a few places, by definition, the people who control those places end up with way more power and inevitably will abuse it. Uh, Renewable energy, by definition, is available everywhere. And that, in and of itself, is a dramatic shift in power balance in this world. Yes, Bill, thank you for being here on this cool, lovely uh, San Francisco Bay Area day. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm an activist, singer-songwriter, and all that kind of stuff. 
But we, uh, I appreciate the last person who asked the question, and it's kind of, we've been talking around the mega heavy gorilla or elephant in the room, and that is the ruling class, the people, the oligarchs, the people who have the money, the power, and everything else, and who control the politicians, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, I see them as uh, two sides of the same coin, and that coin is in the vest pocket of the special interests. And until we change, as we say, change the system, the capitalist system I'm talking about, where the objective is to maximize profits no matter what the cost, and I don't know if there's a pun there or not, but uh, if, it is, if there is, it's intended, that we're not going to go get anywhere, whether Kamala Harris or Donald so Trump. I yes, would, one, I will just say, I, and maybe I, this I was just is going to say one, one last thing. Just um, so I think we, if a peaceful revolution could work if all Fair. the workers and most workers got together and did a general strike. And I, I'm just coming to hear, hear your, because we don't have a lot sure. of time to play around with. Sure. Um, I am beginning to get a little uh, woozy here. So yes. we, we might want to, and I'll try to talk to people afterwards for a minute. I, I think this is a good place to end because I, I will say, I understand your point, but I disagree with you uh, that uh, all politicians are the same. Um, I do not think that that is true. And actually, I think this is a good day to think about that. Um, it's the 100th birthday of Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter in his, Jimmy Carter in the 1970s put solar panels on the roof of the White House. In his 1980 budget, as he was running for re-election, Jimmy Carter put aside money that had it been spent, the, the goal of that money was to have America get 20% of its energy from solar energy by the year 2000. There's no technical reason that that should have been impossible. If we'd gone to work with real vengeance then, we would have had the progress we've had in the last 10 years 20 years earlier. We would have had large supplies of renewable energy available at the moment that China was going through its rapid industrialization. There would be a dramatically different concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today. Instead, we elected Ronald Reagan. Not only did he immediately take those solar panels off the roof of the White House, he made a philosophically different choice about who we were. Uh, America, since FDR, had been engaged in what I would describe as a group project to try and build a society that worked. The New Deal, the Great Society, whatever you want to call it. Plenty of problems along the way, plenty of bumps, but that was the general idea. Ronald Reagan's idea was that we were not engaged in a group project, that we were nothing but a collection of individuals. It was his friend Margaret Thatcher who said there is uh, no such thing as a society. There are only individual men and women. Um, that, that is a stark difference between politicians. Uh, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan were not the same person, and Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are not the same person. I do not say this because I think that they are Perfect. I led the largest demonstration. Having worked hard to elect Barack Obama, I then led the largest demonstrations outside the White House during his tenure in an effort to get him to stop the uh, Keystone Pipeline, something that we eventually succeeded in doing. We will do the same thing outside the Harris White House if we need to. But that does not mean, and I think it is one of the um, most wrong-headed ideas at work in our society that all politicians are the same. Um, I find no reason to believe that, and I think that believing that has led, on at least two occasions, to uh, 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 enough Americans um, making, um, making stupid choices in the ballot box to elect people who led us in deeply, deeply dangerous directions. So I'll just end by saying, no, I, I, get, I, get the last, I get the last word. Um, I'll, I'll just end by saying um, I leave here en route to Pennsylvania, Nevada, Georgia, Arizona. I hope some of you guys will figure out ways to uh, make yourselves heard and felt in as many of those places as you can. 
And we wouldn't mind if California would get back a couple of those congressional seats, too, uh, in the hope that we might hold the House in the next election. Thank you, guys. Very Our much. speaker is, has given a lot of his time to a lot of people today, including us. And I really think we need to call this to a halt. My, apologize, my great apologies for those who were remaining waiting. Go, I'm sorry. I will stand down and talk to people who have questions still. So thank you.